If you want to get the most out of your Lumix S5 Mark II, you need to make sure you set it up properly. And that's why I'm going to help you set it up for video the right way. Everything from picture profiles and monitoring features to saving custom presets and even the secret functions that I use that make this camera truly unique. I'll even show you what feature I assigned to this button here that I've not seen anybody do yet. It's the best button ever and honestly it's changed my life. Well, not changed my life, but it's, you know, it's changed the way that... Now the chapter markers are below in the description so you can skip to any relevant section you like, but I highly recommend watching the whole video because there might be things that you didn't know that this camera could even do. Right, let's get into it. First thing you want to do, if you haven't already, is turn the dial on the top into movie mode. That's going to change the menu into video mode and give you different features and different settings than if you were in photo mode. Then I highly recommend using manual exposure mode so you have full control over all your settings. Just press menu and then go across to the first tab, image quality one, and then press exposure mode. You've got a few different options there, PASM, choose M for manual. Next, I like to set my dials to control the aperture, the IS so and the shutter speed so press menu and then go down to the cog icon and then it's the third tab down operation and then go down to dial set right at the bottom click that and then where it says assign dial I choose set one and that's going to give us control over the aperture on the wheel at the front where your first finger is and then the shutter speed on the dial closest to where your thumb is. You can control the ISO using the button on top of the camera or you can assign it to the dial on the back of the camera around the menu button where the d-pad is. So click menu, go down to the cog again and then dial set and then control dial assignment change that to ISO now if you're like me and you're a little bit worried about accidentally knocking those settings or any of those wheels and changing your settings mid recording don't worry because in a little bit I'm going to show you a handy trick to stop that from happening now there are a few things that bug me about the camera when you first switch it on as default so I like to take care of those next so you may have noticed that sometimes all of a sudden the monitor will just go blank and then it'll appear again randomly now that's because there's a sensor just above the viewfinder eyepiece so that when you do hold the camera up to your eye like that it switches from the monitor view to the viewfinder view without having to press anything. Really handy feature if you want to switch between the two quickly but if you don't use it it's a little bit annoying because your hand can sometimes get in the way. It is better than the S5 and most other cameras because what they've done is change the position of that sensor from below the eyepiece to above so it doesn't happen as often it's better now but if you want to turn that off the quickest way of doing it is by cycling through the options using the LVF button so you can choose the eyepiece just the monitor or both. So I just have it on the monitor. So now when I wave my hand in front, it's not going to turn the monitor off. The next thing that bugs me is the beeping when you press record or the button. So we're going to turn that off next. Press menu, go down to the spanner icon, and then it's the third one down, in slash out one, and then it's the first one there, beep, beep volume off. I also like to turn on the red recording box indicator. So rather than just having a tiny little red dot in the corner of the screen to show that you're recording, it actually highlights a red box around the frame. So it's a lot more obvious that you're recording. I mean, I've forgotten to press record before, but when you see a big red box round, it's very clear that you are recording. To do that, press menu and then go to the cog icon. It's the fifth tab down and the second menu in that red record frame indicator and you can just switch that off or on. So to adjust the audio recording level, go to menu and it's the first video tab and then scroll down to the fifth tab, audio one, sound recording level adjust and then you can adjust it on there. Set your levels to wherever you want them to, press set and you're good to go. I will show you how to adjust this faster without going into the menu later on. You can also choose to have the monitor levels to show on the screen as well as changing the size. Within that same menu, click sound record level display and then scroll down to to set and it says display size small or large. I like to have that set on small so it doesn't get in the way but I also have assigned a button to switch that completely on or off which I'll show you in a bit. The S5 Mark II has dual card slot recording and you can actually change how those work depending on your workflow. So click menu and then go down to the spanner icon and then it's the top tab it's card and file you've got double card slot function click that and then it says recording method click that you've got three different methods 
relay recording. That's where once one card has filled up, it will automatically start recording onto the next card. Very handy if you know you're gonna need a lot of space for filming. Then we've got backup recording. I like to use this one because I'm afraid something's gonna go wrong, a card is gonna corrupt, and I'm not gonna be able to retrieve the information. So having the backup recording means I'm recording the same thing to both cards. If one fails, or if I drop one, if I lose it, or if I accidentally delete something, I know I've got it stored on the backup memory card. So I love that. I'll leave a link in the description for the types of memory cards that I use. And then we've got allocated records. So that means I can set which card I'm saving video or photo to. So I can allocate one to photo, one to video. That way my files are separate and they're not all over the place. Another handy feature for hybrid shooters. I love this camera. It's just an awesome camera. I mean, if they were gonna make the perfect camera, this is it, isn't it really? I know you can do this stuff on most cameras, but just look that. There you go. There you go, Lumix. Right, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm a little bit clumsy, a little bit forgetful. So I have actually changed my settings in between takes and I've not realized. And it's a little bit frustrating. I know, rookie mistake. But this camera has a feature to stop that happening. So perfect for people like me. Press menu, go down to the cog icon, and then the dial icon, the third one down, and then it's operation lock setup. And then you've got these different options here. This is gonna lock all of the functions that you might change by accident. So make sure it's got the locked padlock icon on the ones that you wanna make sure are locked, and then exit that menu. Then what you wanna do, is you can assign it to any button, but this button on the front here is what I've used. Press and hold that, and then it comes up with which feature you want to assign to that button. So if you go down to function two, then down to the dial tab, and then it's operation lock. Click that. Then when you're in the recording screen again and you press it now, it's gonna lock those buttons. And if I accidentally move, the ISO or the shutter speed or the aperture, for example, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't change my settings and it comes up with an icon, operation lock. And if you want to unlock it to actually change them, just press that button again that we assigned and then you've got full control again. Once you've sorted, press the lock and then you're not in any danger of accidentally changing your settings. Now that is just, what can I say? I love it amazing feature for me. Let me know in the comments if you've had the same problem and if this has solved it for you. Maybe you already knew. If so, I'm sorry. Right, once all that housekeeping stuff is out the way, we can now set the camera up and choose our video settings. We're gonna do this via the menu first, but then again, in a little bit, I'm gonna show you a quicker way of doing it for when you need quick access. Okay, so press the menu. It's the first tab. We're going to photo style. You can use whatever picture profile you like, but I highly recommend if you've spent this money on this type of camera, use a log profile. So just scroll across to V-Log. If you press down, you can actually customize the sharpness and the noise reduction. I've just left it at zero and then select V-Log. That's the first thing done. You're gonna get the most dynamic range out of V-Log better than the standard picture profiles. Then if we go down to image format, what we want to do is change the file format to MOV instead of MP4. That's going to give you more information to work with within the file. You've got the option to choose between pixel and pixel, APS-C, which is a cropped mode. If you've got different types of lenses, you can still put them on this camera and use it in APS-C mode. If you're like me, I prefer the full frame, so you can choose full frame. Then you've got record quality. You've got loads of different options here from 1080p to 3K, 4K, and even 6K. I tend to stick to the standard 16x9 4K mode, but lately I've been enjoying the 17x9, the cinema 4K mode, or even the 6K 3x2 aspect ratio, which I talk a little bit about in this video here. It just gives you a bit more screen real estate above and below the image. Great for people who do a lot of vertical stuff for Instagram, TikTok or whatever. Bear in mind, if you do go with the 17 by nine aspect ratio, you will have to change your project settings in Final Cut Pro or whatever editing software you're using. Now you can use 50 frames a second on this camera, but there is a crop. But if you go down to 1080p, you can get 120 frames per second. You can even go up to 180 frames per second, but you lose autofocus. Now I stick to 50 frames a second because obviously it's a better resolution. It looks nicer. 
Then we've got metering mode. So it's the first menu, first tab, image quality, then metering mode. I like to use the spot metering mode because that's gonna give you a meter reading for whatever is in that small area. So I like to set my exposure on this cheek here when I'm doing videos like this. So I'll just point that spot at my cheek and I know that that's my perfect exposure. If you do want a more in-depth tutorial about exposure and how I set mine, you can watch this video here. Most cinema cameras use shutter angle instead of shutter speed. So press menu in the video setting and then go down to the second tab, image quality two, and it's the first one, SS gain operation. And then what you wanna do is choose angle slash ISO. And now as you'll see, when you change the shutter speed dial, we've got an angle instead of just the shutter speed number. So because we're in vlog, when you're looking at the monitor, it looks a little bit flat and gray and it's difficult sometimes to tell what your image is gonna look like. So what we can do is use view assist, which is gonna apply a Rec 709 LUT to the monitor so it looks a little bit more pleasing, shall we say. But you can also load your own LUTs onto this as well, which I think is a great feature. So press menu, go down to the cog, and then it's the fifth tab down, monitor display, and then it's vlog view assist. Click that, and then it gives you the option to choose which LUT file that you've imported. So there's already a vlog 709 on there, that's the one I use. But if you do have your own, it's easy to install and you can choose where to display that LUT. If you want it to just come through the camera monitor, press LUT view assist monitor. If you also want it to come through your external monitor via HDMI, you can turn that on. If you did want to use your own LUTs, what you can do is load them onto an SD card, pop that in the camera, then go over to LUT library, select which slot you want to assign that LUT to, and then press load. And then it's gonna load that LUT into the camera so you can use it. Now, if you're using an anamorphic lens, what's really annoying about some cameras is it's a squashed image and it's very difficult to get framing and imagine what it's gonna look like. But this camera has an awesome feature. It de-squeezes it for you so you can monitor it properly and see what it's gonna look like in camera. Press menu, go down to the cog icon. We like the cog icon, don't we? It's used quite a lot. Then it's the fifth tab down, monitor slash display, and then anamorphic squeeze display on or off. And then you get to choose which type of anamorphic squeeze you need. Right, the exciting stuff now, the autofocus modes. I'm not gonna go crazy in depth. I'm just gonna show you the ones that I choose and why. What you wanna do first is make sure that the lens is switched over to autofocus. If you've got it in manual focus, none of it will work. So a common mistake. We've got a few ways of accessing the autofocus settings. One on the autofocus button, but then also a few more extra features in the menu. So we'll, we'll go through all of that to make sure we've got all the right settings. First thing we wanna do is make sure that autofocus works all the time. So press menu, go across to focus, which is the fourth tab down, and then go down to continuous autofocus, and then we wanna change it to mode two. This means that it's gonna work on the shooting screen before we even press record. Then on the back of the camera, we've got this extra dial that changes the camera from manual focus. Then we've got two autofocus options, autofocus continuous and autofocus single. Now, if you're doing video stuff, it's good to have it in autofocus continuous, because it's gonna track moving subjects better. Autofocus single will, will focus on a stationary subject and lock focus at that point. Whereas autofocus continuous will lock onto something, but if it moves, it's gonna move with it. If we're on the shooting screen and you press the autofocus mode button, that comes up with the different autofocus modes. We've got the option here, if you press the up arrow, it cycles between normal autofocus and human detection autofocus. Normal will just focus on whatever you point the camera at, whereas human detect will obviously detect humans in the frame. And you can just tap on the touch screen wherever you like to select the focus point. And if you want to return back to the center, just press the joystick in the middle and it will make sure it goes back. If you press it again, it will cycle back to the point where you, where you last touched the screen. If we press display, that's gonna give us some more options. We can change between human detection, face and eye, if we wanna be a bit more accurate, or animal and human. So it's gonna detect animals as well as humans. 
If you want to make sure the eye detection display is on, press menu, go down to the cog, autofocus second menu, eye detection display on. That's going to show you a little cross section line where your eye is. If that's off, it won't show you. You can actually change how the autofocus responds to the moving objects, how fast it is to keep up with the objects, and also how fast it is to change the focus. So if you want it to be a little bit more natural, you can get it to go slower and smoother. So the way of doing that is pressing menu on the video tab, go across to focus, and then it's AF custom setting video. Click that and then go down to set. So that gives you the option of changing the speed and the sensitivity. So the sensitivity is how locked on or responsive it is. So if something moves, if you've got it slow, it's going to be slow to react to that. If you want it quicker, plus three, and that's going to give you more response. Then the speed is obviously how quick it keeps up with that moving object. So the different focusing modes. We've got one area human detection. That will give us a small box to focus on. But then if a human steps into that box, it's going to track the human's face. Then we've got one area plus. That gives us a larger box and it gives you a bigger area for your subject to enter that box and be tracked. Human detection zone. Then we've got full area human detection. So wherever the person is in that frame, it's gonna track it all the way to the edge. Whereas sometimes you'll see that if it goes outside of the box in the middle, it will track the human still, but maybe not the face and the eyes. Then we've got tracking human detection. It's gonna follow it wherever it goes. I like the one area human detection because it means I can hold things up in front of the lens. It's gonna focus on that object and when I move it out the way, it's gonna go straight back to my face again. Great for product reviews and things like that. So if that's what you're doing, it's a great setting to use. Switching over to manual focus options. It's got some great focus assistance features like focus peaking. Press menu and it's the first tab again and then scroll down to focus and then you go focus peaking click that and you can press set and then it gives you a bunch of options so the display color I recommend choosing a contrasting color to where you're filming so if I'm filming in a field for example where there's a lot of grass and trees it's all green if I choose green for the focus peaking I'm not going to be able to see it so if I choose red or something like that, that's going to show up a lot easier. Right, what really annoys me about this camera as a default is when you are using manual focus and you're changing the focus, it will actually punch in to help you see better. Now that's great. Some people like that because it means that they can have a clearer image and a more zoomed in image to see if they're in focus or not. Great. Luckily, you can change it from picture in picture or full zoom or even turn it off completely. So to do that, press the menu, go down to the cog icon, second one down, focus slash shutter, manual focus assist. So if you go down manual focus assist display, you can have it to full or picture in picture. Now, if you want to turn it off, just go to where it says focus ring and turn it off. You've also got another thing you can switch on, which is manual focus guide. That shows you the approximate focus distance in imperial or metric measures. So I like to have that set to meters or you could turn it off altogether. And then one last thing for manual focus. I use cinema lenses quite a lot, but then when I switch over to these photo lenses, the way it focuses is slightly different, but you can change them to feel more like manual cinema lenses. So press menu, go down to the cog, and then it's the icon at the bottom, lens slash others, and then go down to focus ring control. So it's set to non-linear, which works with how fast you move. So if you scroll fast, it's going to change the distance quicker. That's great if you want really fast focus changes in a large distance. But you can set it to linear, so it responds to the angle of what you're turning it at. So I set it to linear. Non-linear is great if you're trying to focus on two subjects that are quite far apart and you can't get the focus movement all in one throw, if that makes sense, without taking your hand off and starting again. So you can just do that and go a little bit quicker and it's gonna change focus on longer distances easier. If you like a more traditional manual focusing approach, set it to linear and it's gonna feel more like a manual 
whole lens. And there's also an awesome focusing feature that I explain in this video here if you want to watch that after this video. So for image stabilization, press menu, go to video, others, all of the way at the bottom, and then image stabilizer. So we've got different modes here, normal, but then we've got e-stabilization, which is an extra layer of stabilization, or then there's boost. But I only recommend using boost when you are doing a static shot. If you're trying to get like just a static shot and trying to emulate a tripod, but you're not moving around, because if you are moving around and you've got boost image stabilization on, it's gonna give you a strange warp because it's trying to correct things that it shouldn't be correcting. So only use that if you're standing still. We've also got anamorphic video image stabilization on. You'll find it in that same menu. We access the white balance feature by pressing the white balance button at the top. I ignore all of the preset ones because I like to set my own. So we can, we can add up to four different presets from Kelvin temperatures or four different custom presets. So for the custom presets, all you need to do is press up and then it'll give you this little box. Hold up either a gray card or a white piece of paper or something like that. Press set and then it's gonna give you a custom white balance. You can go in and adjust that further by pressing down. You can make it warmer or cooler or add some more green or magenta if you need to compensate for whatever you need. I've got a full video about white balance that you can see up here. Definitely worth a watch if you're unsure about any of that sort of stuff. But then we can go in and change the Kelvin, which is probably the easiest way of doing things. And you've got a little bit more control over that. What I would like to see is when you set a custom white balance, I'd like it to display what temperature, what Kelvin it's chosen for you. It doesn't do that currently. Again, just remember, once you've chosen your selection, press set, otherwise it will just refer back to what it was before. So make sure you press set and not the return button. If you like to have exposure metering turned on with the camera, you can actually add either a histogram or a waveform. Press menu, go down to the cog icon, then it's the fifth tab down, monitor display two, and then waveform or vector scope. I like to have the waveform on, but you can move where that is with your finger, press the touch screen and move that around to wherever you want. If you press display, it resets it back to the middle position. And you can actually resize that using the thumb wheel and then press set. Now, if you don't want that on all the time and you don't wanna go into the menu to turn it off and on all the time, I'll show you a quick way of doing that in a bit. I also love to use a luminance spot meter. So press the menu, go to the cog, and it's the fourth one down on the second tab and scroll down to luminance spot meter, switch that on. And you can actually move that round with your finger. This is great because we've already got our first spot metering level in the center of the frame, but then our luminance spot meter can be moved anywhere else, which means we've got two different exposure readings for different things. Perfect if we're checking exposure for contrast ratios or checking the highlights and the shadows in the image. And then we've got zebras. I'll show you the two that I have set up. So go over to the settings menu and it's the fifth one down, monitor display video, zebra pattern, and then scroll down to set. So zebra one, I have set at 85%. This is gonna highlight the areas that are at the 85% value and above. So I, I have it set at that to make sure that I don't overexpose my highlights. I found that 85% is a good reading for this and they're not blown out. And also not having it set too high means that you've got a little bit of wiggle room to overexpose a little bit more if you need to. And obviously you can go 95% or even 100%, but I just like to have a nice safety buffer. And then Zebra 2, if you scroll all the way down to base range at 42% and just leave the rest of the settings as they are, press set. We've got two different zebra patterns there and we can switch those on and off whenever we need them. But I'm gonna assign those later on to custom buttons on the camera so I can easily access them. To customize this camera even further, you can actually assign functions to most of the buttons. So the quickest way of doing this is by pressing and holding the button that you want to change. And then it's gonna give you a list of features to select from. The exposure button I have set to zebra pattern and you can choose zebra one, zebra two, or both. And then you just toggle on and off those zebras by pressing that button. Then the lock functions button I already talked about, that's the one I've got assigned on the front of the camera next to the lens. Then my AF on button turns the peaking on and off when I'm in manual focus mode. Return is set by default to show the horizon level. It's like a spirit bubble type thing. The disp 
or display button cycles through what is displayed on the monitor or the viewfinder. Really handy if you wanna get rid of all the information around the side and just focus on what's in your frame. Then I use the arrow sticks on the D-pad for different things. So I have up set to photo grid line. I don't use that a lot, but it's there if I need it. Then if I press right, that changes my anamorphic D-squeeze display. Left is audio levels display on or off. So once I've set my audio levels and I know everything's okay, Okay. To clear up a little bit of room on the monitor, I just press left and then it gets rid of that display for me. Then down shows my waveform. The Q menu is there for features that you want quick access to without going into the full menu to find them. And you can set this up in your own way. You can have whatever features you want in there. So press menu, go to the cog, and then it's the third one down with the dial icon and then Q menu settings. Then it shows you layout style. I like mode one because it allows me to see my shoe shooting screen at the same time as choosing my whatever I need. And then it gives you the option to customize for photo mode or video mode. So press item customize video, you select whichever box you want and then it's gonna give you a list of features that you want. So just for reference, the ones that I have chosen, if you want to copy my settings, I have the sound record level adjustment, the look view assist monitor on or off, then record quality, then I have my three levels of stabilization. So I can go from nothing, if I'm on a tripod, to normal stabilizer, then e-stabilization and boost image stabilization. I've then got my destination card slot function, metering mode, zebra patterns, focus transition, luminance spot meter and photo grid line. I might change these to be honest, but these seem to work for me at this current time. Now I'm gonna show you how to save all of these settings, everything that we've done to a custom preset on the camera. Now there was something that really put me off using this feature, but I found a way around it and it makes it so much better to use. So now I use the custom presets all the time. Before I show you though, we need to save our preset first. So press menu, go down to the spanner icon and then down to the cog, which is the fifth tab down and then save to custom mode. You can even give it a name by going down to custom mode settings and edit title. Now it's very important that you finish setting up the camera exactly how you want it first before saving the custom menu. That's why I show you this thing last because what will happen is if you change something, even if you change one of the menu things, you'll have to re-save that for it to make a difference. So it's very important that you make sure you make all your changes first, then save it. Or if you do make any changes, save it again afterwards. So now if you cycle through the dial on top, you'll see if you go back to your custom mode one, for example, it will have saved all your settings. What bothered me before about this was, for example, if I was filming a wedding and I changed my white balance for wherever I was, and then I turned the camera off in between takes, when I turn the camera back on, it would revert back to those original settings that I'd saved before. And because I'm quite forgetful, I'd forget to check that sometimes. You know when you're moving so fast, you just need things to be there super quick. That's what put me off using the custom modes. However, I found a way around it. Go to custom mode settings and then how to reload custom mode. Now, all of these options were set to on. If you switch them all to off, that means when I turn the camera off or go into a different setting and then back to my saved setting, whatever adjustments I would have made to the white balance, for example, will stay as they were. So I've got full flexibility over my custom modes now. They're not always gonna be that original one that I saved. Now, setting up the camera will make a huge difference to your image quality and your workflow. But if you really wanna get the best out of your camera, there's actually one more thing that you can do to make it feel and function like a cinema camera. If you wanna do this, you should definitely watch this video next because it's gonna show you how to do just that.